I'm very delighted to be presenting about my 1001 story project. It's a global literacy development project in extremely underserved communities. Its model is designed to make this project sustainable without the continuous flow of external funding. The project name 1001 Story came from the story of Shahrazad, 1001 Nights. In early 2006, when I was traveling in Mexico to help build houses for indigenous migrant workers, I realized that their children stayed home or worked in corporate farms with their parents. There was no school or even any reading materials for them. Their parents picked up tomatoes all day long and earned about $5 if they can fill 50 of five-gallon buckets with tomatoes or cucumbers. It was an eye-opening moment for me to see the drastic inequalities of access to education in our world. Since then, I was led to witness the realities of the rural areas in many more developing countries, from Southeast Asia to Latin America, and from Middle East to Africa. Also, that's when I started to think about possible ways to give the underserved children literacy exposure by employing mobile devices. I figured without literacy exposure and development, there couldn't possibly be any foundation for further education for those children. I loaded multimedia stories and sing-along songs in Spanish onto mobile devices and gave them to the children there. Since they didn't have television or radios or any electronic devices, they didn't know what the mobile devices were for. I told them that I need their help to figure out what the objects were. They agreed to help me figure them out. At first, they were grinding the devices on the ground or hitting the devices with rocks. My heart was sunken, but I patiently watched them. All of a sudden, one of the children accidentally turned on the device by pressing and holding the power button for two seconds. Since that moment, everything changed. All other children flocked to the child and asked what he did. The child explained what he did to a few others, and they in turn exchanged their own know-hows among themselves. The spread of knowledge dissemination was incredible. In less than 20 minutes, about 35 children were able to play stories on the devices, and sing along while listening and watching the multimedia stories on the devices. That was my very first mobile learning project and realization of the possibility of designing a simple pedagogical model, maximizing experiential learning and collective problem solving with mobile devices. My projects evolved a lot with a different set of devices and educational games in many more countries. What was great about mobile devices was that I was able to put 40 to 60 devices in my backpack and start the workshops under a tree or in the middle of a farm or on a bus or under a tent. These are madaris, the snake charmers. They perform circus and move from one place to another. These children never attended any school. They may not know their age, but they were really smart children because they advanced so quickly with the math game that I gave them. I was able to involve more students in more projects and raise funds from various organizations. My project name is Pocket School, which is not a name of a particular software or device, but initiative to help children living in underserved regions to have access to education. This is a screenshot of mobile math game to learn positive numbers and negative numbers by planning and executing strategies. This is a screenshot of a farming simulation game to teach adults about financial literacy along with the concepts of microloans, interest, paying off debts by growing crops and selling them on the market. As I was able to expand the mobile learning project, not only in informal education settings, but also formal school settings, one child came to me in a school in Mexico. He said, I hear my friends making noise and laughing, but I cannot see anything. How can I join in your mobile learning workshop? 
That was another eye-opening moment for me. I realized that there is another huge group of students with various challenges around the world. I was so sad that I wasn't good enough and wasn't able to include them in my projects. Luckily, I learned a lot about helping children with various physical, emotional, and cognitive challenges when I visited one of education centers in Dominican Republic. And later, I developed mobile learning games for visually challenged children. With the help of volunteers from Seeds of Empowerment, an NGO, and graduate students at Stanford and other universities, I experiment my very first mobile learning games with visually challenged children in more countries. They loved it. However, I started to realize that I couldn't continue to run my projects by simply relying on donations or money out of my pocket. It's not scalable or sustainable. I'm too small for big challenges. I needed a new model. I needed a, a more passionate and capable volunteers and a new economic model for my kind of projects. Also, there were a series of challenges with these types of projects. In extremely underserved areas, literacy is not highly valued. Many children or parents often don't feel that they need to read. Also, in such environments, there's no role model. When I was growing up, I remember reading about Abraham Lincoln, Gandhi, Einstein, and inventors and great heroes of nations. I was inspired by their stories, and their stories shaped my role model. The children in the developing region don't have access to stories that can inspire them. Lastly, students in the developed countries do not have good understanding of the world outside of their country. There's no subject teaching what the real world is really like or what other children are experiencing right now. Because of these reasons, I started 1001 Story Project. I started to collect stories from children around the world. I gave mobile devices to children to tell a story and record. In extremely underserved rural communities, if you ask children to write a story, in many cases, they can write only one word or one sentence. If you ask them, though, to tell you a story, many children were able to tell a very long story about their lives, things happened to them, and events they witnessed in their village. Those who couldn't write told me or record their stories. Those who could write were able to write me stories. In one of storytelling competition projects, I worked with a company called SMS1 in Maharashtra state in India to send text messages to about 125,000 community members to send a story. I collected more than 8,000 stories and reviewed them with the community leaders to select the best stories and gave them awards. This is a screenshot of a mobile story editor. You can add images to your stories and share with your friends. I also worked with NGOs in Africa. This picture is an NGO volunteer who went to northern Uganda to collect stories from refugee camp children. When we held storytelling competitions in various schools and community centers, Children from other towns walked hours and hours to join the storytelling competition event. This is the simplest diagram showing how the 1001 storytelling project worked. We identify a community first and work with the local NGOs to collect stories through storytelling competitions and they send us translated stories. We work with other volunteers who would illustrate the stories and make mobile apps or publish hard copy books. Some of the apps are sold on online stores and hard copy books are sold as well to raise more money to help more communities around the world. We partner with other foundations to raise funds and I involve Stanford undergraduate students and other university students to travel and actually run storytelling workshops. Depending on their skills, I asked them to run mobile learning workshops as well. This is the published hard copy book 
for free distributions to schools or communities that participated in the project. In this book, as you can see, the author's photo and also the volunteer illustrator's photo are there. Ashura Hamisi is a student in a rural village school in southern Tanzania, and Chris B. Kim is one of our volunteer artists who are constantly recruiting more people to help the project. Seeds of Empowerment is run by only volunteers like Chris B. Kim and many others in various locations around the world. This is Ashura, who is now a superstar in her town. When many of her friends saw Ashura's published books, their interest in storytelling went through the roof. Now many of her friends want to be like Ashura. This is another published book by author Abdul Salam and volunteer illustrator Jia Kim. Their friends are using the books by their peers as their textbooks now. If the school wants the books in their local language, we print them in their language. If they want them in English, we print them in English. When they read stories by their peers, with stories about their town, their interest in the reading them becomes extremely high. I was able to collect stories from various other locations as well. This is a picture of Kakilia, Palestine. Students in this community must go through this checkpoint every single day just to go to school. This is one of the paintings by children in the region. Do you see anything odd in this child's painting? I've been so saddened by this situation there. I asked the students to give me their stories, and I published some of them. There are many stories, but I cannot publish all of them, because some of them are too shocking and probably inappropriate for other children to read. But the stories are from real children and from their own communities. Overall. A story that teaches not only the reality, but message of peace is what I'm looking for. I'm analyzing their stories to find common themes, their perspectives on moral and ethical values, their struggles and views on their country or political situation. Sometimes their stories describe inequality or national policies. The stories are great research data for me to understand the children's lives in multiple angles and aspects. I'm so thankful for those who come up with stories of forgiving, love, and peace. And I'm also so thankful for those who make 1001 Project possible to sustain. The children authors of the books are proud that their stories reach children in other countries. My goal is to publish 1001 stories before I die. I figured that life is just a dash between your birthday and death date. I know it will take a lot of efforts and time, but I will leave real children's 1001 stories behind. Thanks for watching.